Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 14, Episode 108. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Friday, Steelers Nation, Dave. A calmer Friday for now, although those famous last words have been spoken before. When it comes to quarterback, we know it's Russell Wilson, Justin Fields, and today's conversation will suddenly shift towards Michael Penix Jr. from Washington. So why not add another quarterback in this conversation? That is how this offseason has gone. How you doing, Dave? Uh, happy Friday. I am doing well. I'm just learning this morning that Louis Gossett Jr. passed away. Uh You've never said you've never seen off uh, an officer and a gentleman, have you? With Richard Gere and all, barely ever heard of it. Uh, oh, okay, that, that, it. that's a that's a classic that uh, I I think you'd probably enjoy. That was really really good. And obviously too, I think he was. Do you remember? Yeah, you're not old enough to remember all the old Iron Eagle. Uh, <laughs> Dave, I don't understand the words you're saying right now. Movie. I know. I know. But, Iron Eagle. Uh, no, <laughs> the announcer no. from March Madness last night. Yeah, that's the closest you're going to get to uh, uh, get to that. But uh, yeah, such a great. I you know, go look at the disog, uh, not dis- discography. Uh, fi- uh, what do they call it? Filmography. filmography? Mm-hmm. Yeah, of uh, Lewis Gossett Jr. and all. Uh, in 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 quite a few great movies there overall. So uh, sad to hear about it. I it, I've gotten to the age now where I wake up every morning. It's like, damn, that guy. You know, that, that mm-hmm. uh, someone from from my uh, growing up passed away or whatnot, you know, whether it be movies or music or, or entertainment or, or whatnot. But uh, that's not, that's kind of a weird way to start a podcast. So I guess we should get back into football here, but yeah, the, uh, the big news I had to kind of read it twice to, to, to make sure it uh, was it kind of a hoax or whatnot, but uh, uh, go ahead and tell people about uh, Michael Penix and what, what, what's happening there. Yeah, Washington had their pro day yesterday, and Pittsburgh had a couple reps there, although not Mike Tomlin, not Omar Khan. They were there primarily to look at the offensive linemen, but according to Brady Henderson, who covered that Washington pro day, Penix had told ESPN he's got multiple visits lined up, which is no surprise, but apparently the Steelers are part of that list. He will visit the team, come to Pittsburgh sometime in April, don't know the exact date, but probably within two weeks or so, so yeah, I mean, you know, Pittsburgh's still doing their homework. We can talk about you know, why they're looking at Penix, what it means, the possibility of them, you know, considering a quarterback that early. W- what's your initial takeaway on that news? What does it mean? What does it mean? <laughs> uh, my my initial take was or is well, first and foremost, you know, I, I think it's important. Uh, at least from what we know, I, I didn't see the quarterbacks coach. Uh, at, at, at Washington, uh, really didn't see anybody notable outside of uh, who was it? Uh, uh, Pat Meyer, right? And yeah, Mark Bruner, I believe, was, yeah, was there. And, the two reps from Pittsburgh. And, and Mark Bruner, you knew who you could probably yeah. it would have been a safe bet to uh, to bet that he would have been there. Obviously, being from that area, and doesn't his son it, doesn't his son play at Washington as well too? Yes, it's what Carson. Bruner, I believe. Yeah, yes, yeah. so, and then plus he usually shows up at those pro days out there right. and all. And he, he went to Washington, of course, too. Right. So that that's his. He's got a house up there, his territory. Right, right. Uh, first and foremost, from 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 the pe- personnel that we we saw there, it'd be one thing maybe, and and maybe we'll circle back. Uh, cause look, I mean, we don't hit everybody at these pro days. We get a lot of them. No, mm-hmm. <laughs> we we find a lot of them hiding out or whatnot. But uh, um. Uh, I think this is this is just a, a general doing of the homework because a P- Penix I believe is in that group in that next tier of quarterbacks that where's he going to go late first right. round uh, as as far as maybe even in into the third round you know there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that quarterback class a couple of years ago with Kenny Pickett when everybody thought oh man mm-hmm. it's going to be five six quarterbacks taken uh in the first round and you get into the third you know into the third round is when a couple of guys like Ritter and Malik Willis and a couple of those guys so you got to be careful uh with over evaluating 
even quarterbacks in in a league that's 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 always quarterback needy. So uh, I perceive Penix to be in that next tier. Now, where how far does that next tier uh, fall? To and look, this is a left-handed quarterback. There, there's a lot of uh, uh, people probably want to do a lot of homework on Penix because he is uh, in that next tier. And we just saw the Steelers circle back actually to a quarterback that they went and saw at a pro day in, 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 in Justin Fields. Now, obviously that's Ohio state. That's a big program. The Steelers are probably going to be there anyway, that, that court sort of thing there. So, you know, is this, is this a situation of, Look, he's going to be in the league. We're probably not going to draft him uh, here, uh, but we want to get a good sense of who he is and and what you know. We probably lo- know know probably the least about him uh, right now, uh, and and we want to get to know him more. And you know, this might be a down the road road move. So I'm not necessarily. And, and and on the flip side, it could be look if this if this is a guy that falls into the mm-hmm. third or fourth round, you know maybe we w- do want to think about uh, uh, adding to the room, you know, with a guy like this. I definitely don't think this is a a uh, a situation here of let's look at this guy in the first or second round. Although stranger things have happened, but uh, yeah, I, I think this is hey we want to, we want to use one of our pre draft visits to get to know this guy and as we've seen the Steelers over the years and and we just saw it uh uh with the defensive lineman here uh with with Lowry they they circle back to they they use this as a circle back tool uh in free agency as well too so i know a lot of the discussion is man are they are they really going to draft a quarterback here and i'm not you know i've learned my lesson over the years you don't <laughs> you don't paint yourself in a corner and say definitively this is not going to happen but I, I i will say this i'll be surprised if they do not necessarily if they draft a quarterback because i still think there's a a slight possibility later in the draft that this that that this happens but i will be surprised if a guy like Penix, where many have him uh, guesstimated to 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 going winds up being a pick. I think this is a more of a fact finding, maybe down the down the road kind of uh, pre draft visit here. I'm with you fully, Dave. I think what this is is the what if scenario. What if Penix falls and the top four quarterbacks go, and Bo Nix is next, and nobody else needs a quarterback, and so Penix were to hypothetically slip into the third round. Will that happen? I don't know. I'm with you. I don't know where he's going to go. We've heard everything from late first round to second round to anywhere on day two. They'll go in the top probably 100, 110 picks, but that's a, a large range of, of you know possibilities there. So I think it's partly that. I also think it's, you know again, Pittsburgh's quarterback room right now, assuming that Justin Fields' fifth-year option will be declined, which it almost certainly will, and assuming that Kyle Allen is on a one-year deal, which it almost certainly is, they have nobody under contract for 2025. And what if it all goes wrong in 24? And Wilson struggles, and Fields are not confident he's the guy. There is still a possibility Pittsburgh's going to be looking for an external quarterback in 2025. Now, I think that the hope and the likelihood is that they will resign. One of these guys will work out will center field. Somebody will impress and they'll, they'll roll with them, but you can't discount that right now from where Pittsburgh stands. So, you know, that that's a, what if scenario as well. And for Pittsburgh, it's just probably good to stay sharp on scouting quarterbacks. Cause you, again, you might be, you might be looking at one next year. And so to, to stay current on, you know, evaluating and getting to know guys and, you know, really having a critical eye towards the position Pittsburgh was doing that towards the end of the Ben era. And so I think there's value in just, you know, having making sure you're still looking at the most important position in all of sports from a scouting perspective so for those variety of reasons that's why i think the panix visit is occurring i'm with you not going to happen first round not going to happen second round if you were to fall in the third round with those you know pair of picks there maybe but i think pittsburgh's just kind of doing some due diligence on a guy that you know if things break in a certain way maybe that becomes a conversation late day too Uh, i i I would agree there uh and look he you know he is a left-handed quarterback too, so maybe that's another reason to, <laughs> to 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 get a longer look at him to kind of study that aspect of him a little bit more. Not and what he he was already at the Senior Bowl, right? Yeah, he was a Senior Bowl. I mean, I guess with a lefty, when you bring him in, you're not working him out, but right? Maybe right. You just 
talked about the approach, I guess. Right. You know, I, who knows? I mean, uh, what what the real reason? Is. You know, I see some people saying, well, this is uh, this. The Steelers maybe uh, want to uh, uh, have a smoke screen or something like that. And I, I would. Would a team really use a pre-draft visit to try to fool another team? Not even sure who it's going to fool either. You know, people are going to freak out that Pittsburgh brought him in for a visit. I mean, I don't think it's going to really, you know, cause any front offices elsewhere to start second guessing or losing their mind. Okay, uh, but I, I, I would. It just it rolls back to I think there there is a purpose of why they are bringing him in. Obviously, uh, I just feel like it's want to get to know him more with the potential of a if he falls or b. Yeah, you know, we might circle have to circle. You know, might need to circle back to him. Uh, uh, you know, three four years down the line. Sure. So again, I, I don't think this indicates Pittsburgh is going to take a quarterback early. If they were, they'd be talking to more than just one guy. They'd bring in a bunch of quarterbacks, as they did in twenty two when they brought in all the quarterbacks. I think for pre draft visits, Pickett and Willis and Howell and etc. So I think it's a one off thing to stay sharp on the position. And again, you know, Pittsburgh's quarterback situation. For 2025 is murky. We don't know where it's going to go. We don't know who the guy is going to be. So Pittsburgh still probably has to have that, you know, what if scenario where in 2025, you're looking at external options once again. I agree. All right. So that is the, I think, 11th pre-jet visitor that we know, excluding local visits. So hopefully we get close to 30. I I think, you know, visits will probably extend into towards that second week of April. Maybe more get reported along the way. Uh, Pittsburgh's visitor list so far has been concentrated more towards receiver, offensive tackle. So that's kind of where this team's you know needs and thoughts are. I wonder if any of these centers will come in too. Again, the team's not reporting them, so we're kind of in the dark on who they may have visited with or scheduled visits with. Uh, you know, next couple of weeks, but hopefully we get that list filled up a little bit more by the time the draft rolls around. Yeah, no. Uh, within that, uh, Graham, uh, what's his last name? Uh, uh Barton. Barton. Uh, worked uh, had had the Duke Pro Day, and obviously Pat Meyer went a different way, went way different way out 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 to uh, uh, Washington to see both of those tackles out there. Uh, now, uh, who was it? Uh, Arthur Smith was at the Duke Pro Day. Dan Rooney Jr. I believe was at the Pro Day, mm-hmm. and. Uh, who uh, Curry was at? Uh, we think North Curry, Carolina. Yeah, we think Curry was maybe at Duke as well. We have yet to confirm that, but it would make sense. Those three made made a quick jaunt jaunt to to, to get him because they both went. Or we know Rooney and Arthur Smith were at the Duke Pro Day, and we knew we know both of those two uh, went up the road to the North Carolina Pro Day. We know Curry. Uh, was at the North Carol uh, North Carolina Pro Day, so it makes sense. Maybe is at Duke as well too. But I guess the, the 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 big takeaway there was is what what what's the interest level in Barton at this point? Yeah, it's a good question. He had a really good workout by all accounts. Ran well, looked fluid. Um, you know, again, we talk about the history of no Tomlin con, no Tomlin or con anywhere yesterday. That was maybe a bit of a surprise. We're not aware of them being in any location. I know the Big 12 Pro Day is going on. We don't think they were there. We'll see if they're there today. I think uh, offensive linemen are reporting today. I don't know if there's any workouts occurring. I think it's, that's a tomorrow thing. So we're, we're kind of getting an idea of how all that works in this first year of this kind of regional conference Pro Day. You know, it, it's hard to say. I mean, they send the O-line coach to Washington. They send the OC to to Duke to watch the O-lineman and Smith himself, a former offensive lineman who played at North Carolina. So um, I don't know. I mean, history says, you know, if no Tomlin Khan, you're not the first round guy. But for a lot of reasons, Tomlin and Khan have been to fewer pro days this year than last year. They've only been to, I think, four right now. So and pro days are just about wrapping up. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure where to come in on somebody like Barton. It just be, because of his history and his fit and all like that. And is he, Alex, is he being overrated? Barton? Yeah. I no, I think he's being underrated, to be honest with you. Not a guy well, we talked I mean, about. I'm seeing, I'm seeing more. I'm just talking in, in, in a general landscape. Uh, is, is he a slam dunk first round pick? 
I don't know if slam dunk is the word I would use, but I'm pretty confident he will be a first round pick. I think he's going to become a center. I, I don't think he's going to stick a tackle where he played predominantly at Duke. I think he will kick inside. He was working out primarily at the pivot yesterday, but I think he will go somewhere in the first, maybe late. I don't know, but I think he will be a top 32 guy. Okay. I'm, I'm not as convinced as you are. Uh, so I, I'm going to have to roll back in. Maybe I'll do that over the weekend, roll back in, 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 in into some of his tape. I'm, I'm not convinced he, I mean, he's, I mean, he's a heck of an athlete and all like that. I think, I think he's going to be one of those guys that maybe kind of second round where people trying to discern where to fit him at and all mm-hmm. like that. It, do you view him as a plug and play, uh, center in, in the NFL, right, right from the get go If a team drafted him mm-hmm. in center. Do you think he could, from what, what you think, can he be a plug and play guy? I was watching some more Barton last night, and I understand the lack of experience at center will give people pause, especially with after the Kendrick Green mess of somebody who wasn't really a center trying to be shoehorned there from day one. Barton was a center his freshman year at Duke and then kicked out to left tackle and has played there since. But I think he's got all the traits to, to play center right away. He's athletic. He's got good snap and burst out of his stance. He's physical, good pad level, good hand use, good strike. Um, he's been repping center this whole process. I think he's a smart guy. So, you know, there is a more, more of a projection there than say a Zach Frazier or Van Pran Granger, somebody that has a lot of starting experience at center, but I, I wouldn't compare this to green in terms of, you know, him not being as ready. You know, green was so much more raw and just needed much more time. I don't, don't, I don't get that sense. Don't get that feeling with Barton. So plug and play is, is maybe a, a touch strong. But I think if you drafted Barton, you'd have a good de- degree of confidence he'd become your starting center for week one. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I'm going to roll back in through there tonight, man. Okay. So, again, you know, having the level of interest. I mean, obviously, when Smith is at the Duke Pro Day, he's there to watch Barton. I mean, Duke Duke has a, a defensive line prospect in uh, Dwayne Carter. But when your OC is there, you know, he's there for one guy, right? He's there for Graham Barton. and what does that mean? You know, we'll have to see. We know the history of, again, Tomlin and Khan being at pro days. Um, I think Barton would have to come in. I'll put it this way. If they are going to break that streak of Tomlin and Khan attending the pro day, those guys have to come in for a visit, I think. I think you have to do at least that aspect where they're in the building and they're really kind of getting face-to-face time with key members of the organization. Um, I know that there's combine meetings and senior bowl meetings, but I think, you know, going that extra step of, either a pre-draft visit where you're in the facility for hours or you're having a pro day dinner or something like that is a box Pittsburgh needs to check to be confident and comfortable taking you in the first round. I'm going to put on my devil's advocate tinfoil hat for the, Ooh, for the devil's next, ad- the normal <laughs> tinfoil hat. Uh, be interesting to roll back. Does Arthur Smith miss a North Carolina pro day? I don't know. I imagine not often considering he was wearing I think, a North Carolina hat yesterday. So obviously alumni, uh, there was offensive lineman in the early mid two thousands. I, I don't know if he does or not. Okay. I, obviously we don't know because of, you know, him, him not being with the Steelers. We, we had to go back and research and all like that. It, it, it's not really worth that. And Duke is right around the corner. So if let's say, let's say those three, do you think I, I, some of the things I wonder about, we'll never know the answers to. When those guys go to like a group uh, on a pro day, do you think each of them are, are in three different cars or do you think they fly in together and say, hey, you know, uh, are you going? Yeah, I'm going. In other words, do they all travel and then hop in a, a Uber together and go up the road uh, or, or, or rent a car and, and go up together? Uh, let, let's say the three of them started out at Duke yesterday with uh Rooney uh uh Curry and Arthur Smith do they all get in the car together and ride up to 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 North Carolina what I'm getting at here could this have been an instant that Arthur Smith was going to go to the North Carolina pro day anyway and he said hey uh, I'm I'm going to that what I might as well start the morning off in Duke and, and see what's going on. And yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously Barton there is what, 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 what was a draw, but just to get eyes on him. So I know about him at a later date. Is that plausible? I think if it's a, I, I, I get your point. If anything, though, I think it was, Hey, Arthur, we want you to go to the Duke pro day and UNC's right up the road. You can go to that because that's your old okay. stopping grounds. But like, I mean, who has the, the bigger offensive prospect? 
putting aside Drake May, which Pittsburgh obviously will not draft. It, it's Tez Walker in North Carolina. It's Graham Barton in, in, in Pittsburgh. I think Barton's the, the bigger draw right now. All right. And, but, but, uh, North, North Carolina does have that wide receiver as well too. Don't they? Yeah. No, I mentioned, I mentioned Tez Walker. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was a, there was a guy there, but I mean, I think Barton is still the bigger draw of the, of the two names there. Okay. All right. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to look at this from, from, from all angles here. Yeah. I mean, again, it, it, it's interesting. And I think Pittsburgh, I think Pittsburgh was just trying to, trying to split up resources because you had a couple of big pro days, a couple of offensive linemen to check out, you know, Pat Myers out there in Washington, True. as you mentioned. Yeah. Oh, but, and, but you can, you, and here's another thing we probably need to scour the, uh, now the, which one was it? Uh, the Duke pro day, I believe has been recorded. And I think that's going to be shown on the, uh, ACC network, what today or tomorrow? Uh, yeah, some pre-taped thing. I guess what I'm, what I'm getting about at is maybe we'll be able to spot Isaac there. Cause what, mm, good we're, point. You know, uh, as, as part of the where's Waldo, where's Isaac, you know, and, and okay. I get that, uh, uh, Pat Meyer was in Washington and, and why wouldn't he be to, 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 uh, tackle prospects up there that you want to get, get eyes on. So why wouldn't you send him there? Okay. I, I'm good with that. But, uh, you know, why, why couldn't you have sent Isaac to Duke? Yeah, that's fair. Again, Smith has the background of being an offensive lineman, so he can scout that position probably as well as any offensive position, although I'm sure he can scout anything offensively. Um, yeah, then we'll have to go check on, on that. I, I don't know. Couldn't tell you where Isaac Williams was or was not yesterday. All I'm trying to do is trying to discredit the the, the possibility of maybe a Barton in the first did, round. Did Williams coach Barton at the senior bowl? Was there a Barton? He didn't he had an injury, didn't he? He didn't really work out in the um, process, I don't think, until yesterday. I, I memory serves. I'm kind of thinking on the fly here. I'm trying to remember because obviously I know Frazier and, and the issues that he had. Yeah. So anyway, I'll, I'll have to go back and, and, and check on that to see who all Isaac Williams was yeah, working uh, with. Barton was ding, dinged and couldn't play in the senior bowl. Uh, did he attend though? Do we know to at least be for classroom work? And there's still an element of getting to know the man, even though he's not on the practice field. All law, you know, Zach Frazier not working fully, but still attending. Um, trying to roll back and try to remember. I think Barton was at the at the Senior Bowl, wasn't he? He was, but did did he did he participate? Wasn't there an injury? I want to say that. May have limited him. I'm, no, I, no, I well, no. I remember. I, I seem to remember the all him in the all twenty two. Okay. Uh, was he on the same team then as Isaac Williams uh, was coaching? I think Williams was coaching the American team. Or is he yeah. Shrine Bowl? Or was he Shrine Bowl? Am I getting my Am I getting my bowl games mixed up? Mm, I might be doing that. Was okay. I? Because I, I didn't. I didn't go this year. I I, I, I remember Barton. Seemed seemed to me going through the drills at least in the all twenty two from the practices. Okay, no, I'm sorry, I'm getting myself mixed up again. It, he was at the Senior Bowl. Isaac right. Williams was at the Senior Bowl, so I'm just trying to see was he coaching Barton side or not, just to get that extra little tidbit of information on him and the way that Travis Glover, I think, is uh you know being utilized in that way from Georgia State. Okay, all we'll right. Check well, long long story short, uh, Arthur Smith was at Duke. And when the when we get more footage from the Duke Pro Day, we'll scan through there and see if we can find uh, Isaac maybe there. I think I'm confirming. I think Barton was maybe on the national. I don't know. I'm not getting it. it it's just a whole mess here. But we'll check it. We'll check it. Um, but that is yeah. Now let's talk. Let's talk Washington with Pat Meyer and Pittsburgh showing interest in those two potential first round uh, Husky offensive linemen and Troy Fontenot who's likely to go first and then followed by Roger Rosengart, likely to be a later first round pick, maybe early day two kind of guy. What does this tell you, Dave? Sending the O-line coach, of course, no, no, no Tomlin, no Khan when it comes to these two offensive linemen. I wonder, and I, and, and this is a guy first and foremost, uh, with the Troy Fontenot, he was the one that's a little bit undersized as far as length goes. He's still, a lot of people still have him. He's going to be another one of those interesting uh, 
guys to watch here because of he was the one that we went back and said, how many true tackles under, I forget what the exact height height was that we used. Was six, it? three, it's under six, three. I want yeah. Say. Yeah. Have actually been drafted in the first round that went on to have, have career. So a, he's going to be a study in and of itself. And once again, he was a guy that he's done absolutely nothing wrong that I can see through the pro 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 uh, uh, pre-draft process and all like that. I've always maybe contended that Roger uh, Rosengart might be the one when it comes to the Steelers to watch here uh, as a, as a, as a, a potential secondary or third choice should a guy like Mims not end up being the guy in, let's say, round one. Uh, I tend to think that Rosengarten might have the Steelers' eye a little bit more than Fontenot does. Is that just because he's taller, because he was a college right tackle? Yeah, college yes, pro? yes, yes. Okay. And yes. Uh, what was the length? Gar- Rosengarten, 33 and a half. Fontenot's longer, despite being shorter whatever that's worth. Right. Because he's going to be the, once again, he's going to be the in- interesting uh, prospect here. Long, I mean, not only just where the Steelers come from, but uh, long-term. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it was under six, four because Font knew six Oh three, six. And so there aren't many first round tackles that have stayed as a true tackle to be drafted that were under six, four. There's a couple, Isaiah Wynn is one of the most recent names, but uh, we'll have to kind of have a, a test study on thought. I thought Tyler Wise had some interesting clips on Rosengarten. So the book on him, good athlete, needs to become stronger. But Tyler was talking about some of the, the aggressive pass sets that Rosengarten has and how that kind of fits in Pat Meyer's system of being aggressive and not giving ground and chase down sets. And that mentality fits well with how Pat Meyer teaches things. Yeah, and some of the negatives with him, he, he let some hands in his chest as well, too, I think. You know, so definitely uh, 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 from a technical aspect, needs some work, and 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 most of them do uh, that that you see, especially if they're you know not the first round type of guys and all like that. But uh, here's the thing: there was enough interest there that they wanted to learn more about both these guys, uh, uh, and and you get two for one when you send your offensive line coach uh, up there uh, on top of it. But I wouldn't be surprised if you know more, especially if if Font knew winds up being a slam dunk first round guy and as high as, 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 as a lot of people think he might go that, that uh, Rosengarten might've been, you know, more of a, a, a get to know situation. Sure. That's fair. I mean, Pittsburgh, they've sent Meyer to what Oregon, Oregon state and Washington for all their offensive linemen, but Tomlin and Khan did not attend any of those workouts. So are they really going to send Pat Meyer to all those places and not consider them for the first round? despite the Tomlin Khan lack of a, a presence there. Well, that's a whole part of the yeah. blues clues things and all like that. You know, uh, who, who among us is going to be bold enough to pick a first <laughs> round draft pick, uh, in a mock draft in a final mock draft that, uh, Omar Khan and, 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 and Mike Tomlin were not at their pro days, plain and simple. That's, that's, that's the, that needs, that will be put to the test again, yet, yet again. And there's been other years where we've had this conversation too. Mm-hmm. We, we just forget them, you know, uh, this is the year that they break it, you know, uh, or likely to break it and they don't break it. <laughs> right. Uh, now is there going to come a time where this gets broke or, I mean, obviously it's been broken again or broken before with, 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 with Ziggy, but, uh, uh, don't forget that that was a 32nd overall pick too, wasn't it? Or th- 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 what was the year with Ziggy? At what- the last pick? Uh, yeah, it would be 09. They just won an 08. So that should have been right. a double check. Yeah, that was the 32nd overall pick. And, and you, you pick him that late. And, you know, you, you kind of have the holes that you have. And, you know, I, I guess you can justify it a little bit more the later you get in the draft. But, uh, boy, he was a. Uh, Going back and remember that it was a, a square peg round hole mm-hmm. uh, type situation there. But when you know, but anyway, it will be put to the test. The whole work, especially once again too, you know. And we'll see if Mike Tomlin and, and Omar Khan show up to this uh, to the offensive line, defensive line uh, versions of the Big Twelve Pro Day because that's all new. Uh, but I mean, if they. 
that's got to be the uh, the last one that they would likely attend, isn't it? There aren't many others. Maryland's today. Yale is next week. There are some individual workouts for injured players. I know that Christian Boyd and Cooper Dijon from Iowa are going to work out April 8th. I think there'll be some other injury, but those are kind of more private workouts and less reporting on who attends those. But yeah, basically after the Big 12 Pro Day this weekend, Pro Days are done. All right. And they, they've only been to four together, right? Correct. It's Georgia, Clemson, Michigan, and Alabama. Now, I think there's reasons for that. The league meetings screw things up. The pro day schedule in general is a mess. And you have fewer pro days this year with the Big 12. You know, had the Big 12 been holding individual pro days, you may have had Tomlin, you know, show up at West Virginia or something like that. And we'll see if they're at the Big 12 pro day this weekend for the offensive linemen at the least. But you also just have a lot fewer pro days because you have this whole conference that's doing one giant merged workout. All right, and you would I, I would tend to think if Barton was on their radar and, and if they weren't going to go out west and they weren't going to be at, at the version of the Big 12 Pro Day that happened on Thursday, that maybe Tomlin and and, and Khan would have would have been at Duke. Or somewhere, at least. Yeah. I mean, why not take a trip out to Washington? There's a ton of prospects. If you're going to bring Penix in for a visit and you want to see the offensive linemen, I think if you're Tomlin and Khan, you should go out there. Now, I don't know what they were doing. Maybe there were other business things to take care of, but you know, you can take that trip out west, and 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 that's no problem to me. But we'll see. You should also mention just briefly another Duke offensive lineman, Jacob Monk. He's a later round guy, but he's got a bunch of experience, can play guards and center as well, captain. So maybe you hear him as a as a late round possibility. All right, roll while we're talking about pro 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 days, bring everybody up to date on what what's kind of happened, who's been where in the last couple of days here. Yeah, I think among the most notable, and, and you had found this, this came the what the final day of the league meetings, I think, although I don't know what was even happening with the NFL at this point because I think things were basically done. But LSU's Pro Day had assistant GM Andy Weidel show up. We knew about Carl Dunbar attending. We also found later in the day Andy Weidel at the Tigers Pro Day, Ike Taylor also there as well. You got Brian Thomas Jr., Mason Smith, a couple other defensive linemen. Of course, Jayden Daniels, Malik Neighbors will not be options for Pittsburgh. They'll be long gone. But what it seems to be, because this happened last year at the end of league meetings day when Wydell went to Penn State for Joey Porter Jr. So it seems like, you know, Tomlin and Khan can't get away exactly right around that that timeline there. And so they sent Wydell in their place. So what's your, does, does this kind of qualify as a, Tomlin Khan stand in for the for the the rule for the Blues Clues with Weidel, or does it mean something else? Well, we won't know the answer to that until the year. Well, that's why I'm asking you now. Uh, if I, if I, I would have to ask you after the fact. I well, look, I was I was really surprised in general that they did not go to the LSU Pro Day. And they could have other head coaches and GMs were there, uh, unless Tomlin had was tied up with competition committee stuff. I don't know, but Khan, I'm sure, had the ability to go if he wanted to, needed to. And the byproduct of that produced you writing about wide receiver, right? And how it seems unlikely that Brian Thomas Jr. will be the first round pick, or really, I think at this point, any receiver will go in the first round. You can't talk in absolutes, and you don't know for sure, but even... Even if Tomlin and Khan were still stuck in Orlando, yeah, you send Weidel, but you didn't send the OC and Arthur Smith. You didn't send a positional coach, which really surprised me, Dave. I thought for sure mm-hmm. Zach Azani was going to be at the LSU Pro Day for Neighbors and Thomas Jr. Neighbors was working out um, and had a really good you know, performance overall. So, you know, Weidel And, I, and the- I went through that. I went through everything I could find <laughs> on that LSU Pro Day and looking for that. Unless he changed yellow hat, shaved his shaved uh, shaved that uh, scruff of his, uh, I don't think uh, Zach was there. Did Jim Nagy tweet out the list of the I, LSU attendants? Yeah, I, I think he, he did. did. Yeah, and yeah, he does not mention uh, for OC or receiver coach the Steelers, and so I think we're as confident as confident can be that they were not there. So you know, last year. You had the league meetings. The Penn State Pro Day was right after that. They send Andy Weidel, and of course, Jerry Porter Jr. became the second round pick, which is not their first round pick, but still a high high selection. But they also sent to that Penn State Pro Day Terrell Austin and Grady Brown. And so they sent coordinator, positional coach, and assistant GM to kind of help cover Tomlin and Klein, I guess, presumably not being able to attend. This year, you just got uh, Weidel. You didn't get Arthur Smith. You didn't get 
Azani. So to me, that really reduces the odds. Of, even if you want to try to make an exception for Tomlin and Khan not being there, um, to not on, to not have the positional coach and coordinator cover lessens the odds of a Brian Thomas Jr. It would seem that way. Now, back to, and we just talked about Dunbar in the other uh, uh, most recent podcast, I believe, on Wednesday, saying, why haven't we seen Dunbar anywhere? Is there a health issue or anything like that? Well, he tur- so we spoke it into existence, and he was there at LSU, and Mason Smith is a guy that you've talked more about than I have throughout this process, and he fits, and there is a reason. Well, I mean, Dunbar also uh, uh, from, from there. So he's probably, but I mean, there were multiple reasons for Dunbar to be there. And Mason Smith, I believe was one of the reasons, uh, he was there. And then also with Weidel being there, I think that's significant on, on top of it. So, uh, linking all the blues clues together, I think you've got to seriously consider Mason Smith as a potential second, third round prospect for the Steelers here. Sure, you should. He fits. He's got the size. He's got the pedigree. There's a rawness to his game. There's a lack of production to his game. He had a 2022 torn ACL. He's going to need some time to work on his technique. That's the large consensus on him, but that's a potential second, third round pick. Now, there are other defensive linemen that were there, Wingo, Jefferson, or day three guys, but there was a collection of LSU defensive linemen, so all the more reason to send Carl Dunbar, Ike Taylor was there. There's only one DB working out. That's kind of interesting to me. And Andre Sam, interesting safety prospect. Um, but yeah, Mason Smith will will certainly be part of that day two defensive line conversation with Ruka Horror Horror from Clemson, and probably a little too early for Gabe Hall from Baylor. Um, but but Smith will be in that conversation. Uh, I agree. And now, haven't they really mostly kept Ike Taylor generated or, or, or confined to the? Uh, those Southern schools there. I'd have to look. He has this year. He worked out at Miami. Where else did he work? He was somewhere else. Alabama, Miami. wasn't he? Yeah, he was at Alabama. Yeah. I mean, was he, he at goes... Clemson. Uh, no, not at Clemson. He typically goes to where the DBs are at. I don't know where he's been in the past. If he's ever been more North for, you know, pro days, but I mean, he, he's generally there to work out when, when there's a team that has you know, multiple defensive back prospects. All right. Roll them back through the, okay. Uh, uh, roll us back through, through the most recent pro days. Again, we, we talked about LSU uh, and I, yeah, I think it's significant that both Dunbar and White White over there. Right, but I think it's more even for for Dunbar with the Weidel connection in terms of Brian Thomas Jr. trying to link that. I think is uh it's going to be a stretch. You mentioned Aaron Curry being at North Carolina. We've now seen Curry at three pro days this year. Right, that's Kentucky, significant. Ohio that's, State, North Carolina. Yeah, they're they're they're, they're going to draft inside linebacker this year. Right. It won't. It, it, and 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 most most of the guys that they're seeing are perceived to be after third round type guys. Yeah, I would say it's likely to occur in that third, fourth round range. It's roughly where you could say an Eichenberg from Ohio State and Cedric Gray are at. I don't know exactly where Trevin Wallace will go. I think he's kind of viewed as a later round guy than, than those two off the top of my head. Uh, still Chambers kind of in that boat as well. So, you know, it's a question of who and where. It's not going to be first, second round. I think third round is where that conversation begins. But, you know, generally you're not going to send your – positional coach to three schools and not draft the position unless just something crazy happens in the draft. So I think odds are pretty good. They're going to round out some depth even after signing a Patrick Queen, even though yeah. Cole Holcomb's prognosis seems a bit better. Right. Uh, and, and, and at least a couple of those he's participated in the drills too, with uh, talking about Curry. So that's, that's significant. Yeah. Wallace from off draft database is a fifth round projection. These are all obviously pretty loose, but that's kind of where things are at. So yeah, it, it appears they will restock the shelf at inside linebacker. Other than that, I mean, in terms of significant personnel there, they had a bunch of people at pit, obviously, because it's it's right next door. And what else has stuck out to you, if anything, Dave? Uh who who else? What what happened most recently since our last show? Did you roll through all of the significant ones there? Yeah, I mean, you know, Dan Colbert at Tennessee. Dan Rooney Jr. at Wake Forest, that safety prospect, Malik Mustafa is a pretty interesting guy. I kind of think a sleeper in this class. Um, but, you know, those are 
the biggest names and happenings right now. Okay. And we will keep our, once again, I want to roll back through the Duke pro day to see if we can spot anybody else there. And then it's going to be interesting to see what happens in these last couple of days of the big 12 pro day. Yeah. It does not seem like the turnout from a, front office standpoint was great at the big 12 pro day. I'm not aware of any I didn't coach see or GM anybody that I recognized. Yeah. Uh, I saw a smattering of scouts and that was it. St- Steeler uh, scouts. No, no, no. Just, just uh, NFL oh, scouts. Yeah. Oh, okay. Not steel scouts. Yeah. I don't know. Any, I mean, I, I have to think somebody from Pittsburgh was there, but I right. could not find a single soul. Right. I could not either. Not, not and and you know, in past years, we found some after the fact, you know, later on. So we'll, 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 we'll keep rolling through the footage there. I'm secretly hoping that it goes bad so they can scrap the idea of these regional pro days because I don't like these regional pro days. I want my individual pro day workouts so we can mm-hmm. find these dealers guys better and have a better job with the Blues Clues. So I'm kind of selfishly, secretly, but not so secretly rooting for them to fail. I, I kind of wonder if they're going to be successful and we see more more of these. I know. That's my concern. So they'll probably do it again next year and tweak some things and evaluate it from there. But I don't know. It was, it was kind of weird though, just watching it. They were air, aired it on NFL Network. You got like, you know, second round picks in line after like tryout players and just kind of all bunched together. And like, what if a what if a top quarterback works out? Are they gonna have to rotate with five other people? Like, how can you how can a top quarterback go through an actual pro day workout and a script of 50 throws at a pro day like that? I don't know how logistically you could accomplish that. I tell you, if you roll back through that one, they, they talk a little bit about that during, uh, they had Jeremiah and all those guys uh, at the Big 12 one, and if you roll back through that hour, they talk about, some of these guys haven't worked together, you know, uh, when, 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 when the quarterbacks were throwing and all like that. And that right. does add a layer that you have to think that at least the, 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 the quarterbacks and those quarterback personal quarterback coaches aren't, aren't big fans of. Yeah, I don't think you could do it. I think you'd have to have the quarterbacks conduct their own private workout on a separate day or something if you went to a universal every conference as a pro day because you can't have a guy go through 50 throws when there's a bunch of other quarterbacks and prospects to work out. So a lot of logistical things that I actually think actually make these the idea of these kind of conference pro days difficult to pull off in a good, you know, good faith evaluating type of way. Right. Uh, we just I want to go back to just kind of resetting, even from the pro days that Tomlin and Khan have been at, kind of who are the most likely first round picks right now? And I think the consensus is, and kind of almost has been since the draft process began, is a Marius Mims from Georgia, the big offensive tackle, the right tackle there. There are questions and concerns about experience and, you know, just tape enough of, a, of evaluation on him. But talk about guys to check every box. I mean, he's got size, athleticism, pedigree, you know, playing in the power five, Tomlin, Khan at the pro day brought in for a visit. He's checking every box right now. Yeah. You would have, and for obvious reasons for the old blues clues that we like to use, he has to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the driver's seat or leader in the clubhouse right now, as we like to say, uh, it, it, it certainly does feel like and heck it's a need, uh, and then two, if you want to put your tinfoil hat on talking about Omar Khan saying, well, Broderick Jones is going to be a left tackle at some point. We just don't know when could that be because they got to bring along another tackle slow to start the season uh, uh, like they did last year. We know that they're not scared away be- from at least the off- offensive lineman aspect of of not a lot of playing time. Although how, at what point is it too few playing time? Because right. Roderick Jones still had about double the starts and snaps that Mims had in his career. Right. But, you know, pedigree and athleticism and all like that, you know, uh, and plus they finally broke the tradition of it's been a while since they drafted a tackle in the first round, that kind of thing. And then you, you, you also think of head of man, this team, this team is going to uh, the old tre- They made sure to to mention the trenches and how important the trenches are. Uh, uh, once again, this off season, just a lot of little things. When you start adding those pieces together, what have come out of people's mouths and the needs and and once again, uh, uh, who checks the boxes? That I mean, I'm, we're not breaking news here. Yeah. Uh, 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 
Aramis Mims seems to be once again, the leader in the clubhouse. Yeah. The, the only question to me in Pittsburgh's mind would be, is there enough tape, enough experience to take that risk? Cause there is a risk to taking Mims, whoever takes him, you know, in the first round or early in this, in, in the draft, because you just don't have, he's got 800 career snaps. It's just not a lot of tape to evaluate on to stake your claim in a first round pick. Right. Right. I, I agree. But, but other than that, he's checking everything else Pittsburgh traditionally looks for. All right. Beyond him, I think Terry on Arnold has to come into play. Yeah. In terms of the you know Blues clues to stick to that faithfully, the cornerbacks, Arnold, Kool-Aid McKinstry and Nate Wiggins, they, they were working out or, you know, part of the pro day cycle that Tom and Khan have been on. So those are three you know corners to, to add in. Of course, Dante Jackson may lessen the need for a top corner early. But just in terms of the box checking, those guys fit. Uh, and then there's no one. Else. Rook, Rook Witt from Clemson would be considered a candidate, right? Or would he? No, not not first round, not a 20. The other name you can throw in to go back to tackle is J.C. Lassen from Alabama. Right. Now, some people think he's higher than pick 20, but in a deep tackle class, he could slip. Uh, he's not really worked out much in this pre draft process for whatever reason, seemingly has been healthy. But I think Latham, Mims, and those corners from the strict Blues Clues perspective right now is where things stand. And then obviously a handful of Michigan guys. But again, who's the, who's the first round guy there, though? Mm. I mean, I think I think Roman Wilson, second round, second round or third round. I think Sanders still second round for sure. You know, McCarthy's their, their first round guy, though, and obviously not, not, right. a, not a candidate for Pittsburgh. Right, right. So, I mean, the, the, the list, the list is, is short, at least where it comes to Tomlin and, and Khan and first rounders. Do you think Tomlin and Khan need to be at the Big 12 Pro Day for Frazier, for him to be a first round guy? And if they are, does that presumably put Frazier in that first round conversation? Look, if they're there, you can't, you can't discount it then. Uh, you're, you're right. I mean, it, it, it and it, yeah, I, my eyes are going to be peeled these next two days when it comes to that Big 12 Pro Day. You would think they would they would be there. Me too, but I'm not really sure how teams are viewing these workouts because they are kind of kind of funky compared to a traditional. It, it, it's more combine than it is Pro Day, and I don't know if teams are liking that redundancy or or not. Um, what do you make of Dave? And I'm going to write about this probably once the Pro Days are officially done. Not seeing Grady Brown at any of these pro days. I don't know if we talked about that on Wednesday or not. Maybe I'm repeating myself, but no, no Grady Brown this cycle. Well, we would like to think that if he had been anywhere, we would have seen him by now. Does, does that, is that foolproof though? No, no, we're working under the assumption when I say, you know, no Grady Brown, we have not seen him. Could we have missed him? Sure. But from our, the information that we have, and we're pretty thorough about it, not aware of his presence. Now, Terrell Austin, we've obviously seen. Yes, he's been to where? He's, he's just followed Tom Alabama, and Georgia, uh, Clemson. Clemson, Alabama, Michigan. So right. he's been to everywhere the Tomlin and Con have been. Right, right. But for a team that needs secondary help, I thought I think Grady Brown was on the trail three or four times last year, and I just have not. Maybe we see him late. I remember we didn't know about him being at Michigan until like the last second because Michigan is kind of tight-lipped about media access and filming so but there was a lot of footage to come out of that we had not seen them you know yeah how do you not go for sander still i i I can't make sense of that yeah maybe maybe we'll find him but it it is uh, you know you'd think you'd see him a couple two or three times in in the same way that you've seen curry right so interesting there maybe there's some personal thing that's going on who knows but do you want to make note of that that has been one of my surprises of this pro day cycle i tell you where i've missed before mock drafts is not paying close enough attention to to where the where where the actual position coaches have gone because it's so important you know it is traditionally and again that's traditionally first round you look towards head coach gm in pittsburgh second third round you're looking for positional coaches that's kind of basically how they've set things up for for quite some time. Um, and that, that essentially was true last year. They had Tomlin and Khan at the uh, Georgia Pro Day. And then second round was Porter. And they had Grady Brown there. It was Brown, Austin, and Weidel at the Penn State Pro Day. Who was at Wisconsin last year? Do you remember who was for? Uh, uh, it was Curry. Curry. Curry was there. No Dunbar? 
I don't believe Dunbar was there. Okay. Um, and then you have to roll back and look. I don't. I don't yeah. remember. I. I because I remember. I remember the talk being well. Curry was there and Herbig. You know, was was he looking at Herbig? At you know, uh, uh, there was all the conversation of were they looking at Herbig at inside because of that. But I I remember specifically that Curry was there. Yeah, according to our notes last year, it was Curry and Sheldon White, director of pro scouting, was at the Wisconsin Pro Day. And then for, obviously, Darnell Washington, it was the same group as Jones. It was Tomlin, Kahn, Austin, Danny Smith was there. Dan Rooney Jr. was there. Uh, what else? Herbig, yeah, would have been Curry. So, you know, again, a lot of a lot of dot connecting based on Pro Day movement. All right, all right. But, I mean, we got a short list of, for, for once again, for the Blues clues with Con and 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 and, and Tomlin as far as guys that you'd pencil in, and I don't think you can get away without having Mims as the leader in the clubhouse. Right. That just based on those facts alone would put him in that in in, in that pole position to use the Tomlin quarterback phrase for the NFL draft. Any other pro day thoughts? Any other NFL draft thoughts? Dave, you've been watching any guys or any guys you want to get to watch the tape on before? Uh, there, that there's a ton. Uh, that I still want want to look at. I want to go deeper into Arnold uh, from Alabama, especially with the need there. Uh, I want to look at uh, some of these off the ball linebackers a little bit deeper with, that Curry have, has looked at. Uh, want to go back into the Washington offensive line tape to see those two tackles. Yeah, I'm I'm basically the same. Um, so yeah, I want to see some of the off ball linebackers. I wonder who the I wonder who their guy at off ball linebacker might be. I really can't make heads and tails of, you know, is it as an Eichenberg? Is it Wallace? Not quite sure. I would, A, that guy's going to have to play special teams too. So, you know, uh, you would think that any of these three or four, because I guess technically two at Ohio State, uh, is going to be somebody that uh, you could, that, 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 you know, can tackle, obviously, uh, and maybe have a little bit of coverage aspect to them. Yeah, so we'll uh, we'll figure something out. When, when's your first mock draft coming out? Are you doing just one this year? You're gonna I do, might just do two? one. I don't know. I'll probably end up doing two because of peer pressure and all. But <laughs> you know, generally, my first of the two ends up being better than the second, the final one. Uh, generally, so. All right, we'll we'll stay tuned for that. Maybe you'll surprise us there with with two for the month of April. Uh, anything else here, Dave? Patrick Peterson was on a, a podcast for I think Fox Sports yesterday and. You know, talked about was hinting at that he's unlikely to sign until you know unlikely to sign before the draft, and you know was saying the kind of most movement will happen now at this point after the draft once teams know who they got in their their rookie class and can evaluate what their needs are after that. Talked about that he's open to playing safety, but would have to know that ahead of time and basically be told before he signs, "Hey, we want you to play safety," so he can fully prepare for that full time transition that was beginning last year which happened you know, mid-season because of all the injuries Pittsburgh had? Uh, I don't think he really I, – I think he likes having safety on a resume as something that he can help out do uh, uh, do and, you know, break glass. He does not view himself, I, I think, as a safety. And and his final season, which I it, it feels like 2024 would potentially be his final season, it feels like he wants to play outside still or, or you know, some in the slot or something like that and all. But it is going to have to be the right fit for him, and it won't be surprising if that does happen after the draft. Yeah, and for Pittsburgh, again, as I said, I think they're going to go through the draft, see what they can get, see what the slot corner position looks like, and that if they're not happy with who they get in the draft or just that position group in general, they may come back to Peterson at that point. Okay. Anything else here, Dave? Kind of a, a lighter show. We spent a lot of time on the pro days because there just frankly wasn't a ton else to talk about, but um, anything else to discuss? Uh, no, it, I think we've got most everything out of the way there. I'm trying to scroll through, see what else we kind of knew that after the league meetings that, uh, some of this would die down. I guess, uh, Justin Fields has been over overseas. Yeah, that was a comment. Uh, and Bob Labriola has asked an answer that, um, was wondering why Justin Fields has had no press conference, no seemingly interaction in Pittsburgh and labs. It said that Fields was overseas. I don't know 
how long that trip was. I, I think he, cause I remember when fuel said that podcast, uh, before he was traded, he talked about he had vacations coming up. I don't know if he's back stateside now or not, but, but one note there for anyone wondering why we've not really heard much from field since the trade went down. Yeah, that, that, that would make sense there. I'm trying to roll through real quick, see if we missed anything that's, that's, that's very important here. Boy, we went from having a lot of topics to, <laughs> to circling back to pro day focus and, and pre-draft, which obviously from here on out, these, these, these next four weeks, man, we're just what, 28 days as of yesterday, right? Uh, until the uh, first round of the draft gets underway. So it's going to be a lot more. It's time to start cracking the tape a lot harder and going deeper into some of these guys uh, overall here. And I'm not seeing anything else for us to talk about, Alex. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you got Marcus uh, Rosemary Jack Saint had the Zoom call. Uh, He's a potential kind of later round, uh, what, day three or maybe early day three prospect. Yeah, it seems to be about where he's projected to go. Um, physical, the, the demeanor, the play strength is there. The production is not overwhelming. The athleticism is not great, but just kind of, you know, he'll, he'll, if he gets drafted in Pittsburgh, he'll get called to the next Heinz Ward for the Georgia connection and their kind of mentality of just like just high effort, physical, just dudes out there. Um but yeah, the upside is not probably immense with him as a wide receiver itself. Uh, one thing I'm going to probably try to work on uh, this weekend that I know will have everybody excited is uh, more more cash stuff. I want to go <laughs> back and look at uh, where the Steelers were this same time last year in the process of of displaced cash spending versus this year. Okay. Um any are you looking for anything in particular or are you just trying I just, to just compare i i gotta admit i from from where they are right now which was right right around what did i say around 25 million uh after displacement and trades and all like that i i kind of i kind of thought that that number would be higher as we sit here through the bulk of free agency at this point i i kind of envisioned them being around the 32 million <laughs> you know you're talking about well that's only 7 million but they're, 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 that's a couple of players you know uh more than more than veteran benefit contract type players uh i i kind of thought are we are we over are we overrating what has been done so far in free agency in, in what sense just just what they've done so far in free agency i mean obviously look i mean the the quarterback thing is the quarterback thing and you can't fault them because of the lack of cash spent there. Uh, And, 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 and I'm including in that the whole Justin Fields trade, because what you, what you would, what you essentially did is you traded Justin Fields for, for Kenny Pickett and then increased a little bit of cash spending there. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, the, the second part is, I mean, you, you can't fault them because because of Russell Wilson and his offsets and all like that. So the quarterback position aside, and then look, they they obviously made Patrick Queen their highest paid, you know, un, unrestricted free agent, especially in terms of cash and cap hit uh, ever. So so that is obviously significant. But what what else beyond that? Yeah, I think it's important to put in the context the off season they've had as i said before with quarterback in particular they've taken advantage of those unique situations there where it's not much investment but you kind of just you know wilson on that contract offset from denver made him extremely affordable and fields you know just to get that quarterback on the market because the bears had the top pick if the bears are picking like fifth overall fields is probably still a bear like he probably just does not get traded at that uh, point in time so uh, Pittsburgh has not necessarily had a lot of investments besides Queen, but they've had some, you know, smart, shrewd signings and maneuvering overall and got better at quarterback. But there are still, to answer your question, have we overrated it? I, I don't think we've overrated the moves that they've made, but it is important to recognize this team still has plenty of holes that is leaving this roster a bit incomplete heading into the draft. Right. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to tamp down the Deshaun Elliott signing, but I mean, he is, he is kind of what he is. I mean, it, it's, it's a lower level ad. I mean, it was a need and you obviously hope he, he, you know, it, it, you know, ends up, you know, fit being a good fit and, and all like that. But I mean, it's not, it was, it, was it a needle mover? 
No, I wouldn't say that, but it was it was a it was a needed signing. They needed a, a box safety and they got one. And right. that's fine by me. All right. And obviously the the couple of wide receivers that they've added, <laughs> you know, there, there's a yeah. there, there's a there's a decent chance that neither one of those two make make the roster. Sure. I don't really love how receivers been handled so far. Again, the draft will complete things. So we're not here to judge and have final comments on you know how they've handled that room, but they've, they've gotten worse at wide receiver. They traded Deontay Johnson and they've added a bunch of just kind of low level type of dudes, borderline roster dudes and Watkins and Jefferson. So there's certainly more work to be done there. And then obviously the trading of, of, of you know, essentially Deontay Johnson for Jackson, you know, it at this point, it feels much more on the not improving side than it does improving. Right. And again, kind of goes back to, they got, you know, much worse at receiver, got a bit better at corner, still have that as a, a longer term need though, and, and needing depth. And so, yeah, didn't, didn't love that trade the whole way through. I mean, the, 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 the Patrick queen signing is the highlight of, of, you know, outside of, I mean, look, once again, you, you can't discredit them because of the Russell Wilson contract. Yeah, again, they got better at quarterback, which is going to help mask a lot of other potential issues this team may run into. Anyway, I want to look at where the cash spending was at this same time last year. Okay, interesting. I uh, want to see the results of that. We'll talk about it on Monday if that gets up this weekend. All right, Dave, let's get to a couple of reader emails and close out today's show. All right, let's see what we have here. Let's start with uh, Brett and I, a couple of questions about the fifth-year option and compensatory picks. Who was the last Steelers draft pick that they picked up the fifth-year option on? It was not Minka because he was drafted by Miami. He writes, hey, he says he thinks it was T.J. Watt. Uh, that would be correct, right? T.J. Watt was the last one, a uh, last player first round that they drafted that they picked up the fifth year option on. Uh, he says, obviously they can't pick up Pickett. So if they don't pick up Najee, then it would be from TJ to uh, Jones without a first round uh, worth picking up the fifth year option on. Uh, I, I guess that's more of him making a statement more than anything. Uh, uh, but yeah, TJ Watt was the last first round draft pick that they picked up the fifth year option. on. I mean, they they that, did that, pick up Minkas, but they didn't, He's right. saying because they didn't draft him. Right. They're not he, counting that. Right. He wants okay. he he wants to talk about draft picks here. Okay. I got uh, you. When was the last time that this team got a compensatory pick? He says, I'm pretty sure that it's been at least three years. Yeah, it's been a while since they've uh, gotten any compensatory picks and they're not headed down the it, – it's not shaping up to be an offseason where they're going to pick up a compensatory draft pick this year according to Nick, Nick Corte so far. So that's not looking great there. Uh, when you combine that with the dis discussion you have had about the lack of players you might want to extend the last couple of years, aren't there some bad signs for a team that wants to build through the draft? I know you have listed quarterback as the reason for the lack of playoff wins, but doesn't this seem seemingly lack of draft success also play a large factor several seasons of weak drafts? Oh boy, that's I mean you want to open up a can of worms of of wheat. Look, look, this team has got to start drafting better and hopefully this last class, at least after the first year, seems to have been uh, Omar Khan's first, uh seems to be going in a in a better direction, but overall in the last, you know, dating back from from TJ and forward, has it been or from from the class, that would be what, 2018 to 2022, have they overall been underwhelming draft classes? Uh, I'd have to look at it in totality. It's probably not been as strong as other stretches in time, but I, I would just combine the two. When you don't draft well at quarterback, it's hard to win playoff games. And they, you know, missed on Kenny Pickett ultimately. And so that, you know, impacts you as a franchise. So, I mean, there's you know, multiple components to it. And yeah, they got to draft better. I think overall, there's been more earlier round misses than there needs to be and there should be to be successful. But it all comes down to quarterback play, as you said, Dave. And again, when you draft, you don't draft that position correctly. That hurts you all the more. Are you surprised we've gone this long from? And once again, I uh, technically you've got to, even though he's not including Mink in there, you got it. You got to include Mink in there because they they went out, they got a first, you know, 
a former first round pick and and they did so with the idea that they would be picking up that fifth year option and all like that. But uh, a team that builds through the draft, especially specifically for the Steelers, they're hoping that first round guys end up for obvious reason, end up being franchise players and they're forced to pick up the fifth year option and then extend those guys. Yeah. The goal is not just to pick up the option, but to have second contracts with those guys. So yeah, I mean, you, you know, and you, that you impacts cash. That. That in that impacts cash spending down the line as well too. You know, sure, yeah, because they're you know larger salaries when you talk about fifth year options for for most of these positions. Yeah, I mean, again, on Minka, I get the point about drafted players, but also Minka was not like a slam dunk. Okay, this team will pick up his fifth year option when they traded for him. It was his second season. He still you knew looked like a decent player, but you didn't know exactly what his arc was going to look like. Miami was kind of misusing him, so. It's not like they drafted him and picked up the fifth year option two months later. You know, it was, I still credit them for that, but I get the question about strictly Steelers draft picks. All right. Old buddy uh, Eric Sorensen writes in. I know I rarely write, but I'm still following the site, listening to the podcast from my vantage point in central New Jersey. Some time ago, I think it was prior to the draft in 2013, Dave made me laugh by saying something like, well, if the Steelers draft Cordero Patterson. Someone will need to get him a box of crayons. Uh, that memory stuck with me. In fact, I still derive humor from it. How do you feel about Patterson now? This came in just a couple, couple of days ago. Uh, how do you feel about Patterson now? He has likely exceeded our collective expectations as a kick returner. I was excited about his take from Tennessee, and now I'm delighted to finally see him as a Steeler. Uh, with gratitude to you both for all you do, Eric. Uh, look, I've, I've, I've tried. I've, I have on this podcast taken the L several times on Cordell Patterson. Uh, I don't know how, how, how many more different ways I can take the L on him. Now I am somewhat vindicated with him as a wide receiver. Am I not? Yeah. He never became a, a down to down receiver. He, obviously his staying power was his great kick return ability. And look, he, ha- look, he has been uh, once again, the, the fact that he has made and, and switch positions and, and, and had some effective time at, at running back as well too. I mean, once again, guys don't stay in the NFL just because they were former, you know, high pedigree guys. Teams do not have an issue of running, you know, basically letting guys uh, work themselves out of the league quickly. So it is a testament to Cordero Patterson that he has may, may, uh, been able to uh, uh, navigate these waters and 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 find a role in the NFL, which he's done. He's he's once again, you know, uh, uh, solidified himself as a kick returner. Uh, his running back play cannot be discounted. And you add both the, those things together. That's why he's still in the NFL, and that's why we, he's with the Steelers right now. Uh, absolutely. But yeah, I you know, I, I wondered about Cord. I I had a lot of questions about Cordell Patterson coming out. Sure did. And we all have misses. I mean, I didn't really like Cam Newton coming out. I was pretty critical of the Le'Veon Bell pick, although I think that was because he was too heavy and, and you know, he dropped weight once he got into his second year in the NFL. But yeah, I mean, you, you do this thing long enough, you project and give your opinion on guys, you know, we're all, all going to miss. Uh, let's go to Todd Gensler right there. I just listened to Josh Carney's terrible take on Mim. Sounds like he is a lock in the Steelers. Should pick him up. Uh, if he's still on the board at 20, my concern is his actual playing experience as well as his injury history. Do we really know about enough about him? Do you feel his monster size? He's going to be injury prone. He says, I'm all for it. But if we take a chance on him and he never gets to the field due to repeated injuries, we just blew a perfect opportunity to fill a different spot. What are your thoughts? Look, Todd, Todd I mean, we've, we've, this has been that, 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 that's the talk about Mims. If Mims had, you know, uh, if Mims had more tape and, and didn't have the injuries that he's had, we probably wouldn't even be discussing him at number <laughs> 20, right? Yeah, he'd be a top eight pick overall. So, yeah, I mean, that that's that's obviously the concerns with him is his, his lack of actual snaps and, 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 and the injuries that he's had over there. Uh, that That's whoever he ends up with, even if he ends up with Steelers, that's, that's going to be the talk about him. And yeah, there is, there is the, the risk element, uh, involved with him, but then there's also the up, the upside element, uh, revolving around him as well too. So, uh, and look, it, it, 
is he a lock to be number 20? No, <laughs> but he sure seems to be the leader in the clubhouse, as we talked about earlier in the show. Seems to be. Now, the experience and the lack thereof is a concern, which was obviously influenced by injuries, but I wouldn't call him injury prone. He had a high ankle sprain in 23. He missed some time, kind of nagged him throughout the year, but I'm not aware of really any other injury history beyond that. It's just the one ankle sprain, which can happen to anybody at any, at any time and, and take you down and, and they're a pain to come back from in, in short order. So wouldn't have the injury proneness as a, as a concern, you know, in terms of, you know, is there a concern about his size and being too big? I mean, that's for the doctors to, to determine. And oh, what's the study of human movement, kinesiology, whatever that is. I mean, that's kind of, you know, gait and those types of things. I don't have any expertise on, so I couldn't tell you about his injury proneness. Those are different skill sets. All right. Uh, Todd Bays, right. Said, Hey, thanks again for amazing coverage. The team is supplying uh, this wild off season question on how pro day workouts are ran. Seems I see several posts about Steeders coaches and scouts putting specific players through drills. Any idea how those are decided or can each team put players through drills they see fit? Sure seems like a lot of Steeders personnel are running things at some of these pro days. Thanks again for all your coverage and insight. P.S. Dave, stop worrying about the podcast being too long or certain topics being boring. We true fans uh, love it all. If folks don't like it, they can just turn it off uh deprive us true fans of yin's infant don't deprive us uh true fans of yin's infinite wisdom okay uh look uh i i would like to say that i know exactly how these things happen at at, at pro days i would be lying if i said that i do have theories though a lot of times too and by by us watching and and searching these pro days and, and uh, to, too much over the top at times <laughs> uh, with, with, with what we do. And it's because the old competitive nature of, of us internally like finding guys before other guys of the site find them. But I mean, just in general, the more that you kind of study these things, a lot of times what you'll see is it not just be, even though you say Curry ran, ran the linebackers through drills, uh, or Meyer ran, ran the offensive lineman through drills, you'll usually see a collectiveness of two or three position coaches that maybe showed up specifically at that pro day position uh, coaches. And my theory is, is they get together and say, mm -hmm. hey, I, I'd like to run uh, this the, the, the linebackers through this specific drill. Uh, why don't you run them through this drill? I'll run them through this drill. Or if there's multiple in there, especially with O-line coaches, Chris Morgan, you know, former Steelers offensive line coach, Chris Morgan shows up at a, mm -hmm. a lot of these. And sometimes he'll just be standing there in the collective group if he's not actually running the drill. So my, my thought is that they, they all show up there. They 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 see who of the position coaches are there. Uh, it's no secret who they're there probably to see. They're, none of them are trying to hide that. But if there's one specific drill that they would like to see them run that maybe the other doesn't run, they would get together and say, hey, I'd like to run them through this, and you can run them through this. So a lot of times – and even Ike Taylor, at, when Ike Taylor's at a couple of these days – uh, here, he's not the only one running them through drills. Right. Uh, yeah. is, is that kind of your take on this? Is that they're showing up and they're saying, okay, uh, and, and and look, we don't get to see the full portion of these things either play out. I mean, like, like, like the North, did they even show the North? Did they even show that footage on the North Carolina pro day uh, on, 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 on ACC network, NFL network yesterday? I don't believe they did there. So uh, we have to go off of what we see, but I would like to think that the way I presented it is more than likely the way that it goes. I think you're right. It's probably not a super, nuanced or exciting answer they get there they collaborate yeah you know, i'll put them through this drill you go through this drill um i would just say two other things a it's not like the drills that one coach will run versus the other are going to be radically different they're all kind of looking and thinking about the same things overall so you know whoever puts a db through a wave drill probably be any of the coaches there and you're getting the same you know things you're looking at it's not going to be dramatically different so um it probably doesn't matter a whole lot they're all going to basically be conducting the same or similar types of workouts. I would also just say if you were to get a 
you know, seniority type of coach in there, a household positional coach. You know, for example, when Jeff, Jeff Stoutland shows up at your pro day, he's going to run the drills because he's Jeff Stoutland, one of the best offensive line coaches in football in Philadelphia. Um, he ran the Pitts pro day for for uh, their offensive lineman the other day. So when you get one of those kind of like, you know, quote unquote names as your positional coach showing up, they probably get to, to run the drills they want to or run the workout, but it's probably a collaboration about just how they approach things. And I would imagine when Carl Dunbar walks his butt out there to the. <laughs> I mean, he runs the combine D line drill like every year. So, yeah, for sure. You know, uh, uh, they, they probably all defer to uh, uh, to let him take whatever portion he wants to run. So, Todd, we those are one of the things, Todd, that if we ever had a position coach on, it would be shame you know, on the podcast, either former or current. It would be shame on us for not asking those because I, I've thought about that. I mean, it's a great question, Todd. Uh, it really is. And and if if you go deeper surface, m- more than surface stuff, uh, in other words, you're not just a casual fan that, that, that you want to get into the inner workings of what happens throughout all the processes and all like that. Yeah, these are the these are the type of questions that 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 you ask and. You know, shame on us if we ever get a position coach. You know, uh, like and I even Ike Taylor. How how was that? I I could answer that for you. I bet. Honestly, heck, what we should do is kind of waste. I actually I don't think waste the question, but let's get one of those Daniel Jeremiah audio calls because he knows how it works. He was a scout. He doesn't even have to be positional coach to know how the pro days work and ask him a, a brass tax right. type of question. Right. To do that. Right. Right. Uh, good question, Todd. Uh, let's see here. We get one more in here. Edward Arnold writes in, I'm sure this has been, I'm sure you hit this in the podcast before answering emails, but do you believe the Patterson signing leads to Najee getting more money this season? Like you mentioned in the previous podcast, say, say options like Mims and JPJ are available at 20. What would it hypothetically cost for the Steelers to trade back into the first pick at pick or, or trade back into the first pick? Oh, in the first uh, at pick 21 to draft both players back to back. Also, would you and Alex encourage a move like that? Uh, Eddie, first and foremost, it's so, I mean, we're, I understand we're, we're reaching critical hypothetical trade back uh, type scenarios. Uh, man, they're endless. You know, uh, Eddie could have one and next two emails could have, will they, will they do this? I think, I think it all depends on how the, I, I will give you the answer that probably Omar Khan w- w- would give you. It depends on how the board breaks. It depends on if the next two, three, four, five players or guys that we have r- ranked right there along with them. How does need play into it? What what does the actual trade value look like? I mean, it's endless when you get into a specifically trade back situations because obviously when you're trading up, you're trading up to go get a guy. Mm-hmm. Right. When you, when you're trading back, you're trading back, and if you're doing so more than one pick, you're probably doing so not knowing for sure if it's going to be one specific player. You think that you know, but you don't know. <laughs> As Jim Jim Mora uh, uh, rant, rant that we referenced several several, several uh, podcasts ago uh, goes. But I mean, it, it just it, it it becomes endless when you get into hypotheticals, especially a trading back. Uh, what was his hypothetical to go back one spot? Is that say, what he said? Say options like Mims and JPJ are both available at twenty. What would it hypothetically cost for the Steelers to trade back into the first? At in other words, trade out, but then trade back into the. Oh, to trade out of the first round and then trade back into the first round? Right, right. Oh, and pick God. 21 to draft both players back to back. Hmm. I'm sorry. I'm still understanding the question. To, to draft both players back to back? How are they drafting both players back to back? Are you okay, saying okay. to draft somebody oh, at 20 I, I, and then I, trade up to get yeah, to 21? Yeah, I guess that's where he's going here. So, in other words, you, te- you take either Mims or JPJ at 20. Okay. And then, and then trade up to 21, trade like, like Houston last year with right. Anderson and Stroud. Right. Uh, boy, that would be uh, two first round picks. That would be quite monumental in, a, in and of itself. That would be something we'd be talking about for the next couple of days. Yeah. When has that happened before in Pittsburgh? It's been 
a long, long time, um, if ever. Uh, I mean, so yeah, the question is, okay, what does it take to go from, you know, to pick 21? Well, it's going to take certainly pick 51 and additional compensation. So 50, it, probably 51, one year thirds, something next year is probably how that deal at minimum would look. And that might be even on, on the light side of things. It gets busy and messy quick when, when, when you talk about some, I, I understand the hypothetical and all like that. Uh, and uh, look, I, I, I think if you want to talk about offensive linemen being the first two picks for the Steelers, to me, the most realistic aspect would be Mims at 20, Frazier either at their original second round pick or going up to get Frazier. Yeah, I think that's a lot more likely and obviously a lot less costly. Um, but yeah, to entertain it, I think you'd have to go one of two camps to go from to get 21. You either have to trade next year's first round pick and maybe something small to get 21 uh, or say 51, 84 in this year's draft and like next year's two and maybe other some other pick swap or something like that if you wanted to avoid giving up next year's first round. As, as, as far as this question about Patterson signing leads to – uh, Najee getting more money this season. I, I, I think, I think you got to se- separate the church and the state there. When, when you talk about technically adding Patterson to the running back room, L- let's face it. How surprised would anybody be listening to this podcast? Even though this Patterson deal is two years, $6 million reportedly. How many of you would be surprised if Patterson's one and done? Alex, would you be surprised if Patterson's one and done? No, I wouldn't be surprised by that. I mean, let, let, let's face it. The, the timing of this happening and the kickoff rule. And uh, to me, it's an added bonus that Patterson can play running back. Yeah, and he'll get some looks. He'll get some offensive right. work. But, you know, the, Pittsburgh's not going to start really messing with Harris's and, and Warren's reps much because of Patterson. They know what they have and they like that that top two pairing. I, I don't think Patterson has anything to do with what Harris gets financially. I think right. they're two totally separate things as you I, alluded to. I, I, I agree there. So I, I, I think it's dangerous to, you know, yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I, I don't think there's a correlation there with, with Patterson and Najee. Maybe uh, the, the thing to watch here with Najee, not only with the fifth round uh, option, or fifth fifth year option decision coming up in May. I think the biggest thing to watch with him is 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 what has happened with the running back market this offseason and then correlating that to what happened to Christian McCaffrey a couple of years ago. You know, if you're and, and then Najee's age and wear and tear and what he's done so far, obviously he stayed on the field. To me, it's the if you can make it work in the cash situation and and maybe this will maybe this is coming into play with us talking about the cash hasn't been look we think pat farmer is going to get extended this offseason right you're more confident than i am i just wonder if he's going to bet on himself or pittsburgh's going to try to come in a bit lower but yeah it's obviously if somebody's going to get extended you know it's it's him or or naji well it's also james daniels but but point is yeah it, it, it could certainly happen right now who you know if, if, if Firemuth's the leader in the clubhouse of possibly getting an extension this offseason, who would be second? You mentioned, um, you've mentioned yeah, James. I think, I think Daniels, I mean, you know, he's done well. He's last year of his contract, but Harris is going to be up there. I mean, conventional wisdom, I think most people would say Harris. And to me, the only way this happens, if it's someone other than Firemuth, at least, at least in my projections from a cash perspective, would be that they don't spend that extra money cash and free agency here. Okay. Because that would loosen up five, six, seven million dollars to, 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 to add to cash to an extension. And it's trending that way. Cause I don't know who they're going to spend the money on at this point. Yeah, it is trending that way at this point. I, once again, I, I thought they'd be up in the $30 million displacement as far as cash spending right now. Now, can mm-hmm. can they still <laughs> we'll get off this podcast sure. and, and to two of those uh, uh, honey hole uh, $6 million, uh, two years, six million, three, three players sign two years, <laughs> six million dollar contracts. And uh, lo and behold, we're up over the 30 million mark, right? Uh, sure. uh, within that. But I, I just, I wonder if maybe they 
I, I wonder if maybe they're wondering if they can get Najee extended and, and, and start to meet her running on him before the fifth year option. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I just, it, 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 the way cash spending has gone because the, the, the market with the running backs and because, Hey, let's, let's go ahead and get the meter 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 started on Najee now with a contract as opposed to next year. Uh, I, I do wonder if maybe they, they might be trying to work on something with Najee. Yeah, I, I, it's certainly possible. My expectation is that if an extension were to take place, they do the fifth year option first because it's just it's a busy time right now to try to work out a, a long term deal with sure. the running back. And so I think you just you, you pick up the fifth year option, and then after the draft in June, July, before camp, you try to work out a long term deal if that's where you want to go. Sure, there, there, there's no rule against that. Uh, obviously, yeah, and, and because you're dealing with a running back anyway, it's not like his market value is going to change. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, all, all you've done at that point is saying, well, next year we think you're worth nearly $7 million. Yeah, are, are there any running backs about to get paid? I feel like they've all been paid in free agency. Are there any teams looking to do extensions with the position that might change their market value? I'm not aware of any anyone in that, yeah, in that position I haven't, right now. I haven't deep dived that uh, at all. I'd have to look at the list. In, ETN uh, in Jacksonville in that same class as Najee. I don't know where where he stands right now. Yeah, I suppose that that's something to look at there as well, too. So anyway, uh, yeah, I, I would put Patterson meaning anything to Najee getting more money. Long story yeah, short. For sure. All right. Uh, I think we've uh, gotten through some of these. Let's see. Pittsburgh writes it uh, about Brandon Ayuk, even though it hasn't happened. He says, I love listening to the breakdown of, of Brandon Ayuk. I know you mentioned on the last episode that the 49ers could get him into the current cap for 2024, but what about 2025? They're currently over the cap by 23 million, uh, per over the cap. And they still have to pay 40 or 50, uh, million a year. Uh, that kind of, uh, look, you, you not only did I clarify that I don't follow them, you know, I don't follow their cap situation day in, day out, but I think I outlined where they're at, at least in 2024. It gets real messy when you start trying to project another team's cash and cap spending beyond a certain year. I understand the point there. I will tell you, though, but, that when you look at their top heavy uh, uh, roster, just 49ers in 2024, uh, logic and would tell you that one or two of those guys aren't going to be on that 2025 team, whether it be McCaffrey or whoever, you know, so mm-hmm. the, they, they would probably obviously have to trade or, or part ways with a couple of those top heavy guys. So all that stuff, as I like to say, generally comes out in a wash. Uh, I believe John Lynch, when he says they want to re- resign him. Uh, and, and I, you know, once again, until they're, until the embers, are fanned more and they seem to have died down quite a bit when it comes to, especially since Lynch has talked when it comes to Iuk and the 49ers potentially trading them until there's more to talk about. It, it feels like it's a, it's, it's kind of a dead topic right now. Yeah. I know we talked about it a lot and maybe some people were annoyed by it, but we don't often go down that road considering kind of these rumors. And so it was something kind of different to do. I know I, you actually did just speak on, I think Chad, uh, Ocho Cinco's and Shannon Sharp's podcast, but uh, he didn't say anything earth shattering. He just says he wants to get paid essentially. And, and that's not new news overall. Didn't mention Pittsburgh. I don't believe or anything like that. So, um, it probably just going to cool it on the guy you talk until there's something major that were to come up all right i think we hit about the hour and a half mark uh alex and feels like a seinfeld episode <laughs> <laughs> show about nothing uh, not a lot to talk about probably going to be like that uh barring, dave, barring who knows dave don't even yeah. jinx it you know well, i mean free eight you know obviously you could have some free agents signed right. here uh there's going to be We'll wrap up whatever's left of the pro day circuit. and We'll hopefully start building out this pre-draft uh, visitor list a little bit more. But uh, if there's, there's, there's very few lulls in the NFL calendar overall. And I think we're kind of about entering one of those somewhat lulls right now. Yeah. Pro day is quieting down some pre-draft visitors, but it'll, it should be relatively speaking calmer until the draft. 
All right. Uh, unless something monumental happens, we'll be talking to the folks again on Monday. So in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter slash X at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, SteedersDepot.com. Hit the donate button up right. Navigation bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, SteedersDepot.com. Hit the donate button or hit the uh, ad free button up right. Navigation bar. Follow the directions that way. So, until Monday, maybe, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.